It's always a thrill to come out here after a belly dancer. <laughs> I don't know whether to flip up and down my zip. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the failing aviator. That's just kind of a big, broad briefing, and it's originally started out for crew members, but it has a lot to do with us in this business, uh, whether we're crew members or not. It was done originally and, and was talked about originally by a guy by the name of Frank Dully, who's a, a flight surgeon for the Navy. And Frank and I worked together on this. My background is in psychology, and I spent a lot of years living with you clowns and figuring out what's kind of making you tick. And the reason why I studied this, by the way, is because I was kind of a failing aviator. Uh, I came back from Vietnam and had some problems with that. And anytime you have problems with yourself, what you do is normally study about them because you don't go see the nut doctors and all those other people. And I ended up getting my degrees in psychology so that I could learn why I was all squirrely. And uh, <laughs> after doing that, what I did then was turn around and listen to y'all and put it in a little format briefing. And this is a stereotype briefing, and I'm saying y'all fit inside this, and, and, and that's not true. Some of you do, some of you don't. Some of you fit in a little bit, and some of you don't. But the idea behind this briefing is to get you to think a little bit, to get you a little bit aware of who you are and what causes accidents in this business, okay? And so with that as a, as, by the way, there's one other thing. If I say anything that sounds crude, I do not say it for the sake of crudeness. Uh, I will say it because the same way that you would tell me if I was doing the research paper with you or research work with you, if I asked you a question, you would come across a certain way. Aviators have a certain way of speaking. And so with that as the background, <laughs> let me go ahead and start. Okay? <laughs> yeah. There are four things that you must have in your personality uh, in order to do this kind of business. Those four types of uh, parts of your personality. Number one, you must be in control. Number two, the male-female interface is characterized by distance, and that's an emotional distance. Number three, you're a mission-oriented compartmentalizer. And number four, you're extremely predictable. Those four things are in your makeup if you're pretty good in this business. Now, that's just kind of an overview, so let me talk about each one individually. Number one, in control. Measured input gives measured response. I move yoke to right, airplane turns right. Uh, I turn on a little knob and a little radar thing goes whipping around, okay? Stimulus response kind of thing. Well, if it's so good in the flying business and any other businesses we're in, then why couldn't it be good also at home? It is, you use it. You try to be in control of your children, your family, your wife. You try to be in control of just about everything that you come in contact with. And if you can't be in control of that, then you will exit stage left. Let's say that uh, tonight the wife says to you or the husband says to you, hey, uh, we're going downtown tonight, hon. We're going to go to a little convention here I want to go to. And you say, oh, sure, you know, we'll go. So you go down and you find out it's a gynecological convention. And they're all talking about things that you really don't know that much about. And they're talking in uh, Dr. Rees. About 7.15, y'all will be yawning. <laughs> it's awful late, hon. But I think it's time to go home here. Because, see, you can't sit there and talk about the things you like to talk about and control that. And so you will find a way to exit stage left on that. Um, usually you're the oldest son or the oldest daughter. And if you're not the oldest son or daughter, then you were the controlling son or daughter in that family when you were growing up. And you lived under the auspices of the old man. And the old man, for most of us, was a little strange and different. He. Uh, he didn't say some things to us when he needed to. He didn't tell us that he loved us after we got to a certain age group. We got to be about 13 years of age. That seemed to be about the turning point. He stopped giving out a lot of that warm, lovey, affection thing that he normally did beforehand, and he started using symbols of affection. Well, I'd love to take this gentleman up here in the front, and let's say that at 16, he went out and he cut the grass, and he did a real fine job of it. He came back in, expecting the old man to pat him on the back, telling him he was a good son. What did the old man say? Nice job, son. Uh, why don't you take the car out tonight and get a little bit? <laughs> See, that's the way he handled that. <clears throat> that's the way he told him that he cared. And so you and I spend a lot of our time looking for symbols of affection uh, from people around us, from our jobs, etc., etc. And what better way than the kind of rank that we wear on our shoulders? Uh, that's kind of a control thing. It shows a little bit about the affection of our, our job for us. It gives us some more rank. How about the kind of wings that we wear? That shows we've been in control. We have some affection from the people around us. 
especially if we got a star on top of there and a commode post on top of that. You know, well, we've really been around for a long time, you know. And how about those medals? Now, how many of y'all wear your medals on a day-to-day -day basis? I look out here and I see one. One. How come the rest of you clowns don't wear them? Then bring them. Well, why didn't you bring them? Then bring your blue uniform. You can wear them with that. You know why you guys don't wear those? They're symbols of affection, but you know that everybody else in this unit in here, in this room, has about the same amount as you got. Everybody gets them. You've been in the service 10 years? You got about two rows, two and a half rows. Been in about 15 years? Three, four rows. Over 15 years? Maybe five rows. Everybody would give them out with water, like water. You want a couple of these? You've been around with them and take two of these, all right? <laughs> and so we don't wear them because we all know what they're worth. But I guarantee you one thing, folks. If you ever have to go downtown in your Class A uniform, <laughs> that's who you are right there. Those clowns downtown don't know, okay? <laughs> hey, look at who I am, boy. That's me. It's that symbols of affection. Somebody says, what's that one on top? It's pizza. Hell me, but ain't it pretty? <laughs> Made 18 cents for it to be X. Love it, okay? <laughs> those are symbols of affection, and we reach out for those things to make us feel important about who we are. <laughs> <clears throat> most of you as aviators and non-aviators in here, most of you are safety wired in the pissed off position. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing today? Fine, thank you. Everything's just great. No problems whatsoever. You ever notice in your own squadrons and groups and units, everybody's always fine. Everybody's always walking around like this. What a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the way life is? Is that the way you feel? No, that's just the way we present ourselves, okay? And we always walk around being fine, and all of a sudden something will happen to us, and we'll really get cranked up, and you get cranked up very easily. Auger into the ceiling, we get you back down, we say, how you doing, fine, thank you, everything's all right. You, know? <laughs> you get over it fairly quickly once you get into it, once you get to thinking about it a little bit. But most of you are safety wired in a pissed off position. As controllers, you groove on other controllers. The people that are around you, you like to have as controllers. Now, why would you like to have other people around you as controllers? because they're like you, okay? If you ever get in a situation with this friend or person, then you can know how this other person will react to that situation. In a way, they're kind of a spitting image of you. Now, you might only have, some of you say, well, I got 15 friends. For most of you in here, you have maybe one, maybe two, and at max, three very close friends. People that know you directly, something about you inside. Most of you, it's one or two, because it takes a lot of energy to divest into the other person. <coughs> Most other people know the fake you. Only one or two know the real you, okay? And for sure, those one or two very, very close people will be controlling people exactly like you, and probably they'll be in the same business that you're in, okay? You like controllers so much, you marry them. Most of you are married to either first daughters and or controlling daughters, and for the gals in here, her sons are in controlling son. And we have likes of track at that period of time. Why would you marry someone like that? Why would you marry someone who's strong-willed when you're trying to control her? That's a good question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the reason being is this. <laughs> the reason is this. You don't want to take your wife out in front in public and say, look at my wimp wife. <laughs> You're the most strong lady. Shut up, bitch. Okay? <laughs> you want somebody with strength around you. You want to show your own masculinity through her. That's why. When have somebody go out there and say, look at your wimp husband. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. Yeah. Um, we marry strong people. And one of the things we'll tell you that if you are married to a very strong person, you must have a written or unwritten rule between the two of you. That when one speaks in anger, the other one keeps their daggum mouth shut, period. Don't try to control the situation. Try to listen to what the other person's saying. If you do not, you'll be married singles within five years. You might be living together, folks. <clears throat> but you'll be talking about weather, TV, food, but you ain't gonna be talking about what's in your gut because the two of you are going to be fighting over that and you won't be able to talk to each other about it. By the way, if you've been in this business and you're over 40 years of age, you have around a 47% chance of being divorced. And if you don't think that doesn't cause a lot of problems in this business, you better take, around, take a look at it, because it does. It's a very serious thing, okay? <clears throat>
Aviators are poor in feelings. We don't want track marks up and down our back for the defect of showing feelings. Feelings are for queers and sissies, for people that are light, people that have some weird uh, ideas about life. And so we have shams and facades. The, I'm fine, thank you, everything's all right. No problems whatsoever. And that's what we show everybody, because that's part of this business. Think about it. Let's say you go up to your squadron commander tomorrow and say, I don't really want to go fly. I, I don't feel good. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get uh, grounded, you betcha, <laughs> real quick. So that's not something that is presentable in this business. And so we have these shams and facades. And we tell ourselves that we're fine, thank you. By the way, you'll be the last person in the world to know when you're getting a divorce. The reason being, you think you're fine, thank you. And you've seen it within your own units. Gee, I don't know why old Joe got divorced. I thought he was fine. Hell, he did too. He thought everything was super, and I'll explain that phenomenon later on. He thought everything was just super, which brings me to my second point. The male-female interface is characterized by distance, and that's an emotional distance. Why? Emotions are risky to show. You can get crapped on for showing your, your emotions. They can be misunderstood, and we just take them as defects, and so what we do is submerge them. We get rid of them. A very interesting thing that we did in this research work was we took y'all out as individuals and we put you in a room, I don't know whether it was you, but it was some of y'all, and we put you in a room individually and we sat you down because we wanted to figure out how well you handled your emotions and how well you knew what they were. And we pissed you off individually. By the way, you're the easiest group in the world to piss off. Okay? <laughs> if we know something about you, one little defect of your character, we can piss you off within about two minutes. It was very easy to do. And we'd take these individuals and sit them down in a room and we'd get them all pissed off and we'd stop the interview and we'd say, hey, we want to ask you a question. And we asked the young person that had just been in the business a short period of time, we'd say, what are you feeling right now? And the young guy would say, I'm pissed off. I'm angry. And we'd say, good, man. At least you're in touch with it. We'd ask the older troop. And guess what? In about 70% of the cases, they would say, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> or they would give the intellectual pursuit to a feeling. I feel like you shouldn't do this to me. I feel like this is a bunch of crap. I feel like this is unfair. And we say, no, not what are you thinking, what are you feeling in your gut? In about 70% of the cases, we had to take out a list of feeling words and say, would you mind picking one of these out? <laughs> it's in there somewhere. <laughs> And of course, when you don't show your feelings, what does your old lady or old man say about you? You unfeeling SOB? You have no idea how I feel. You have no idea how the children feel. You people don't feel. You're unfeeling people, okay? Usually at the ages of 35 to 45, you're gonna go through some kind of a life crisis. And that life crisis is you're gonna have to get out of service, your kids are gonna leave the house, the wife might be leaving you, those sorts of things and all of a sudden you have some feelings about it. Now, who are you gonna tell your feelings to when you have real bad feelings over something? Let me give you the list, okay? Wing commander. You gonna tell the wing commander you have problems? No, I don't think so, no. How about the squadron commander? He's your friend, he might know about it. How about psychiatrist? No way, that's only for weakos, right? You know, for sickos, right? How about the chaplain? No, no, I didn't see it now. How about, uh, well, how about the old lady? You act it out in front of her, and you'll go home and say, I'm having this problem, and, uh, and you might even act it out bad. In other words, you might even do it in anger because you don't know how else to act it out that you're having a problem over these things that are coming up. Guess what your family, and especially your wife, will say to you after you've been controlling her for the last 15 years? <laughs> Sit on a rotate, Jack. That's your problem, okay? That's your problem. And that's going to create more problems in your own life. When you finally show your feelings, you do them some weird ways. If you show your feelings, sometimes you will exit stage left, as I said before. Let's say, and I want to point this out in a different way. Let's say last night the wife and I are arguing about children. My wife and I argue about children. Uh, we argue about sex. We argue about communication. We argue about money. 
Is there anything else in here to argue about? I'm not too sure, okay? <laughs> By the way, we don't argue a lot about communication. We don't know how to communicate to each other. So we argue about the other things. The number one cause of divorce in this business, by the way, is lack of communications. We know of a fa as a fact that it's at least 91% the number one cause of all divorces, if not more, okay? But we don't talk about that because we don't know how to talk about it. Let's say we were arguing about the children last night. In 1105, we came up with a solution as to how to handle this problem with the child. At 11.05 and five seconds, I'm sound asleep, man. I don't have to deal with it anymore. It's all over. We wake up the next morning. We're sitting down at the breakfast table. And what's the first thing the spouse says in the morning when you wake up after a problem the night before? Okay, babbling on about it. What's the best way to handle it, guys? Oh, honey, it's uh, 5.30 in the morning. I go out and open this water up for the guys. I'm about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and I go exit stage left. So that when I come home that evening, she hopefully will have that problem solved for me. I don't have to deal with it again. We like to deal with problems one time, solve them, and never look at them again. That was the problem. The solution was found. Let's not deal with it again. If an individual loses control and shows his feelings in this business, sometimes he will act in anger and violence. Y'all are number one in the United States of America as far as professional people are concerned. And I'm, I'm classifying you all as aviators and Air Force people. And I'm classifying you with, uh, let's say, lawyers and doctors and that sort of thing. Y'all are number one in the United States of America professional groups as far as child or wife abuse is concerned. Number one. Interesting statistic. Very interesting. You're, by the way, number two in that group is race car drivers, so you're in a very elite group. Keep up the good work, guys. Uh, yeah. You're number four as far as child abuse is concerned, so you're going to have to work a little bit harder. But the last act of a rational to an irrational man in order to control something is to reach out and do something in a kind of a physical mode when he can't do it verbally. And we do that. We like to hide it under the covers and not talk about it. But I know from the side of the field that I worked on, and it's very much true in this business, more than you would ever think, OK? <clears throat> Individual in this career field usually deploys one to two weeks before he goes TDY. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Now, why would that be? Why would you start to deploy before you go TDY? <clears throat> See, that's a safe home that you live in. That's an area where you can go home at night, put your feet up on a coffee table, turn on the TV, drink a beer. By the way, that's all your wife says you ever do. You take no other responsibilities for the family. Uh, you just bring home the money. And at least you can kind of forget the worries of the day there. Now all of a sudden, Uncle Sam says, uh, you're going to answer like turkey for the next six months. And that creates a little bit of feelings inside your life. And so you get those feelings, but what's the best way to handle them? Kind of submerge them a little bit. What you actually do is what we call a half step backwards. You actually kind of withdraw just a little bit, just kind of get into your shell a little bit. That's your way of starting to put that separation between you and that house and that family. You don't want to leave there necessarily all the time when long tea was. Who's the first person in your family that sees that? You betcha. Charlie, you turkey shit, you're getting ready to leave next week. How come you treat me like this? You see, you can't, yeah, you can't talk to me that way, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and for the last three days before you get on your TDY, you're at great odds with your spouse. And you're fighting each other tooth and nail. And when you leave, you say, serves her right. Piss on her. Let her take care of herself. <laughs> and when you leave, she's saying this. Thank God he's leaving. <laughs> now I have some freedom and peace. But you're funny individuals. Once you get on your TDY, you change the way you look at the world and you start to have guilt feelings over what happened when you left. And you start to write home all those warm, mushy love letters. Dear Jane, I love you so much. Golly, you're such a neat lady. I can hardly wait till I get home tonight or next week and put my hands in you. Oh, you know what I mean, honey, babe. Gee, you're such a wonderful mother and a, a wonderful wife and I ad nauseum love Fred. And you will continue to write those letters the whole time that you are on your TDY until you're ready to come home. And you know you can't pull that crap off. That ain't you. And so you change your letter writing the last week you're out there, and you write a different letter home. Dear Jane, the weather out here is fine. The guys and I are flying our butts off. Don't have a lot of time to write. Uh, hope to see you soon. Affectionately, Fred. That's who's coming home, bitch. Okay? <laughs> the same one that left. Don't want you to understand that, all right? <laughs> 
And when you get home, you brag to all your crewmates and squadron mates about what you're going to do when you get home. I'm going to go home and get some tonight. You're lying through your teeth. You ain't going home and get anything. Why? Who's in control of your family when you've been going TDY for a long period of time? It ain't you, folks, okay? It's the old lady. And who wants to be in control of your family? It's you, yeah. So when you come off the airplane, what do you start doing? Picking. How come the tire pressure of the tires are down? You know I like to keep 32 pounds of tire pressure. Uh, how come the car's not clean? How come the house has been changed around? How come we're not eating at 530? And you will piss and moan for about three days until you feel like you're back on top of the roost, and then you'll get some, okay? So don't lie to me or anybody else about it, all right? Speaking of getting it, I want to make sure you understand your average. You get it every 5.1 days, okay? That's the national average for air crew members. <laughs> <laughs> Is that TDY? Is that no, no, that's at all. <laughs> So don't lie to me about how great you are. By the way, the national average for everybody else in this country is every 4.7 days. <laughs> so I'll put things in perspective. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're a mission-oriented compartmentalizer. You put everything inside its own little compartments. And the reason being, and what makes you so doggone good at this job is, when you get into, let's say, the flying compartment, that's the only thing you're into. You don't have to worry about what the boss said. You don't have to worry about the wife or the husband said, the children are doing. You get into that compartment and you do 100% of your ability. You fly, okay? And so if it's so good for that particular aspect for those of us that are aviators, why shouldn't it be good for the rest of the day? It is and you use it. You wake up in the morning, you have what we call the three S compartments, shit, shower, and shave, okay? You do something very, very set in the morning if you have a set routine set up. In other words, you're going to the squadron at 7 or 7.30. And you get up in the morning, you do a biological function. Now, some of you all get up and get the paper and some coffee, and then you go in and sit down on the throne, and, you know, the king's on his throne now, you open up the paper. By the way, you all can, you have perfect control of your bowels. It's absolutely amazing, guys. It's time to crap in three seconds, okay? It's just time there. And you all can do it for a certain period of time, and all's the same way. I don't know what it is. It's amazing for you all. And you have a very set pattern in the morning. And then the second thing you'll do if you shower in the morning and use a straight razor, you will use the shower second. And you all shower the same way every day. And there are certain ways you go through your body. I won't discuss that, but there is very certain ways that you clean your body. And when you shave, you shave one way every day of your life. Every day of your life. First thing you do is you open up the medicine cabinet, you reach in there and you pull out the little shaver. You, Wait, hairs, come here, bitch. I want to talk to you about this. <laughs> the second thing you do, if everything's perfect, you'll take that out and you'll shave. If you're right hand, you'll start on the right side. Your left hand, you start on the left side. And you'll shave. Sonny Chuck's here in the hand. <laughs> And that's the last area if you don't have a mustache. And if you used 33 strokes this morning, folks, tomorrow you'll use 33 strokes. 10 years from now, you'll use 33 strokes. You've got it down to a science, OK? Every once in a while, you look in the mirror and say, wait a second, I don't want to be so rigid. I don't want to start this. I just for the heck of it today, I want to kind of change. So you get over here, you get about the third stroke, you nick yourself, you say, piss on that. <laughs> <laughs> you say, now wait a second, all men do that. No. This was the interesting thing, is we were doing the professional groupings and looking at a lot of the professional men, bankers and doctors, etc. Yeah, they are very rich in that. But we did some of the groupings that were, quote, non-professional, and it's a wonder some of those people don't cut their throats in the morning. <laughs> you get in there, and every day is something different. It's a new experience for them, you know. But you all have a very, very set routine about the way you do it. You come downstairs from your 3S compartment, you sit at the breakfast table, and if your family's there with you, you know, let's say it's 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, you hold court. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, you're perfect. Golly, Mom, you got a perfect system set up for your life, and what's wrong with these clowns that you're raising up and this wife that you're married to? What's wrong with these idiots? They don't know how to run their life. And so we tell them first thing in the morning. I'll make sure, Jane, you get to the commissary. We're running out of cigarettes and some food here. And little Johnny, don't get in trouble at school today, because if you do, then Daddy's going to have to beat your butt when you come home again tonight. And 
little Jane, make sure you have the dishes done tonight so we don't have a hassle with that. See, we're perfect, and we're trying to make our family exactly like us, God forbid, okay? But that's the way we see life. And it's one of the reasons why we have problems in life, because our family doesn't even want to be like us, okay? They don't want to come close in most cases. We drive to work. That's a special compartment. We work at a desk. That's another special compartment. And then we fly. Those of us that are fly flying, uh, that's our very special compartment for aviators, okay? That's the one, that, the reason why we're here for all practical purposes in this business. Most of us would never take some of this trash if we didn't enjoy something about that one particular aspect. And so we keep that sacred among all other compartments. That is the one thing that makes us tick, as I will explain to you later on. And then we have some other compartments. We call them the all other compartment. I call it the garbage pail compartment. And inside this, we put things like our own mortality. If you've ever scared yourself, especially in an airplane, you're going to chunk in a little five-gallon bag over your shoulder. And the reason why you're going to put it there is so that if you ever get in that same position again, you can reach back in that bag and pull it out and look at it before you really get to the final point. We do not like to look at our own deaths. We do not like to look at our short lifespans sometimes. <coughs> if I asked you individually how long you're going to live, most of you will say about 93, 87. It's amazing how long y'all think you really truly are going to live because you're afraid to look at the death in its face. Now let's say we were flying along after we've scared ourselves before. We're getting into the same situation. We're in control. As soon as we get into that same situation again, just before we get to the hairy part, we're going to pause for one fraction of a second, reach back in the bag, pull it out, and we're going to look at it and say, yeah, the next thing I did the last time was I kind of kicked the right rudder and scared the piss out of me. I ain't going to do that again. No sir, Bob. Mm -mm. I don't want to scare myself, OK? And so we keep it in that little five-gallon bag for that reason. We put something else here in this little bag. It's called infidelity. Oh my golly, don't talk about that. That's terrible stuff to talk about in front of the big group. No, I want to talk about it for a specific reason. I want to tell you what happens. This is not a morals lecture. This is a lecture about life. We're saying three things about if you're unfaithful to your spouse. Number one, if you're not, don't start. Number two, if you started, stop. And number three, if you can't stop, we say one other thing. Why like a son bitch? <laughs> now why would I say that? Why would I go about saying that? Remember, number one, who you're married to. You're married to a controller. Number two, as you go through your life phases, you change the way you look at the world. And what was good for me when I was 20 is a little different when I'm 30. And by the time I'm 35 and 40 and 45, then life is a whole lot different to me then. And all of a sudden, I might start having guilt feelings over those things that I was doing before. But once I get into a habit pattern, it's very difficult to break. And so finally, the guilt will build up, and I'm going to have to tell somebody my problems. Who am I going to tell my problems to? Let's go through the list again. Wing commander. <laughs> Squadron commander. <laughs> How about the uh, psychiatrist? Heavens no. How about the priest or minister? Who are we going to tell our problems to if we're having problems over uh, infidelity? Does anybody know? Or no, they already know it. <laughs> the spouse. <laughs> Because in your own viewpoint, that's the only person that can relieve the guilt. And finally, after this all happens over a period of years, you're going to walk home and you're going to walk in the house and say, honey, I got something to tell you. Last of the week, I was out and this girl just happened to sit down in my lap. And it just happened so fast. Boy, I'll never do it again. And the guilt is gone for a second. But don't be uh, too much uh, shocked when somebody says something like this to you. Remember who you're married to, a controller. And she says something like this to you because she knows where your kind of bad faults are, and that is your macho image. She knows it's a weakness for you. And she looks at you and she says, well, that's all right, my dear. You know, a lot of people have those problems. You see, I did it myself last week. <laughs> my wife is screwing with you. It's all right for me, but it ain't for her, okay? My wife is screwing around. My golly. Well, I've been doing it for 10 years, you say. So you're going to try to out-control her. And she says, no problem, the football team last month. She's going to beat you guys, OK? And she's going to crush your ego. She knows she can do it. And you're going to destroy her also. By the way, we want to make sure you understand one other fact of life. If you're messing around, there's a 67% chance somebody else is in your family, too. See, it's not as good for her either, OK? 
I want to make sure you understand the statistics if you're involved in it. All right, that's not a moral lecture. All we're saying is if you're not doing it, don't start. If you are doing it, stop. And if you can't stop, then go see a priest, minister, whatever. But don't bring it in front of the spouse because it's going to destroy two of you, okay? You have another compartment called the get home itis compartment. Inside this compartment, we put little things like, hey, we're good. Gee, we've got over 500 hours flying time. You know, shucks, we're really proficient now. And as you get into this sort of thing, what you'll start to do when it's ready to come home, you're ready to come home, you'll start to take little minor chances. Not major ones, but just minor ones. And you'll say, you'll go out to the aircraft and you'll say, how is it today? And the crew chief will say, well, it's real good except for, well, one of the radios is bad. And you'll say, well, how's the other? It's fine. Well, how's the HF? It's fine. Okay. And you'll say, wow, shucks, it's VFR, not a long hop. Let's go ahead and press. And you'll press and you'll make it through. And you'll continue to do those things because you know you're good. You've been around a little bit. And so what you'll start to do is back yourself in a corner you can't get out of. On get home itis missions, those missions where you're staging back home because you want to get back there after a long TDY, there's a much higher mortality rate than on any other mission you fly except for two. There are two other missions that are worse than that mission that I just talked about. Anybody know what they are? Combat, no. Believe it or not, combat is not up there as high as these other two missions. Mostly because we fly these other missions more than we fly in combat. Uh, search and rescue and medivac. Those are true missions to kill. It's like when we get involved in that sort of thing, what we're saying is, I've been training for the last 17 years to save somebody's life or to do something special for the world. Therefore, I'm going to take the training aside and I'm going to go out and do my job now. And when we put that training aside, what we're really saying to ourselves, it's all right to run a checklist a little fa faster, cut corners, fly faster and lower, etc., etc. And there's a 25% higher mortality rate on those missions than almost anything else you will ever fly. And what we're trying to tell you from this part, part of the view as far as the psychology is concerned, all missions are training missions, including combat, search and rescue, etc., etc. And if you ever get out of that mode, you are trying to become an accident statistic. So make sure you understand that and take a look at that. <clears throat> Those missions are missions to kill. You got married and your spouse lives in a marriage. You all understand that? Or? You, all get, you all got married and your spouse lives in a marriage. It's the same thing, isn't it? There's not much difference. Yeah. The girls are going, no, it's not. And the guys are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me explain that then. Let's say, are you married? Sure. Okay, I take this gentleman here. Two children? Sure. Absolutely. I'm boy and girl? Yeah, boy and girl. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Go and girl. Dog and a cat, too. We got them all. All right. Let's say we set this gentleman down and we say to him, uh, tell us a little bit about your family. He says, well, sure. He says, uh, I was married uh, November 27, 1972. Uh, wonderful wife. She's 31 years of age. Uh, we've got, uh, and she was born such and such. He tells us a little bit about her. He tells us about the two children when they were born. He didn't have too much trouble with the dates, believe it or not. He does pretty good with that. And he'll talk a little bit about the children. And then we'll say, he'll stop. And we'll say, go ahead. And he'll say, well, that's it. Yeah, you're supposed to get out and grow up and have a good job and get married, have a couple kids. And I've done it. That's it. We said his wife, Dad, we asked her the same questions. He said, tell us about your marriage and your family and your husband. She'll say, yeah, we were born, uh, she'll give the same date. She'll talk about the dates, when, how old you are. She'll talk about the marriage itself and the two children. And she'll stop basically the same place he stops. And we'll say, go ahead. Guess what? She goes ahead. She talks about how she's keeping the marriage together, how she's working at it as a 24-hour day job. We say, what about him? Said, no. Uh-uh. He comes home, sits down, and so puts his feet up, drinks a beer, and watches TV. Well, doesn't he help you? Eh? No. Doesn't he tell you he loves you? No. Well, doesn't he tell you? How does he tell you that if you ask him? How do you all tell your wives that you love them? What do you mean I don't love you? Look what I bought you last week, bitch, for crying out loud. Yeah, <laughs> <Hey>, Christmas. <laughs> Look at the house you got here. That's how we tell them we love them, and that's how we look at life. We grow up, we got married, 
and we live in that marriage only because that's part of us. They live in it because it's a 24-hour day job. They do not perceive you as being members of that job. It might not be true in your, in your family. I'm just saying that's the perception in a lot of cases. You're predictable. You're systematic and methodic. You're checklist free. Checklists get you through your daily life in, the, in this business. They get you through check rides. They, they get you through flying. They get you through maintenance maneuvers. They get you through anything you do. There's some kind of a checklist in the Air Force for it. Well, daggum, if it's so good for the Air Force, why shouldn't it be good at home? It is. You use it. Don't you all have checklists at home? I don't mean written down on a knee board or anything like that, but don't you have checklists? Sure you do. Let's take a vacation for y'all. Don't you have a checklist for your vacation? Okay, family, uh, we're going on vacation this week and all that. Uh, tire pressure's been checked, the oil's been checked, okay, gas is up, car's clean, everybody got their underwear, check on it, okay. Uh, four cans of beans, got that check. Speaking of vacations, your vacations are for shit. <laughs> <laughs> they stink. They're miserable. They're rotten. Now, why would that be? Let me give you the classic scenario of an Air Force vacation. <laughs> okay, family, this is God speaking. <laughs> this year, we're going to have a wonderful vacation. We're going to go out to Yellowstone National Park. We will be departing St. Louis, Missouri, 06.53, Friday morning. Everybody got their watches on? Heck, heck. <laughs> We'll be heading west on I-70, and you'll go through the whole route with them. Because you've got to wire down to a minute. And we should be getting into Yellowstone at 07.45 in the evening. We don't talk to them in military time. They can't understand it, OK? Plus and minus 30 seconds, by the way, when we get there. So don't trap old dad. Dad's not quite that close, OK? And God help it if it's 6.53 Friday morning when you're ready to go and you've been ready for the last 15 minutes, pacing around the car saying, where's the family? Little Johnny's still in the crapper. Because <laughs> the first thing you're going to do is get mad at the old lady. How come you didn't have little Johnny ready for crying out loud? You know I'm ready to go. Well, you already got a sweat be built up on you, huh? Okay? <laughs> so when little Johnny comes out, we're going to have to put him down a couple pegs, too. What's wrong with this little crap head? You know, he ain't perfect like us yet. Jeez. There's something wrong with this family. Good God. I have control of them. By the way, your family will never be like you. You play by a military drummer, and it goes at a very certain beat, very steady cadence. Your family's drummer goes, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, man, I don't play by nothing. All right? And if you don't learn to at least kind of settle back and enjoy your family as they are, you will not know your family. In fact, your children will leave the house and you will not know who they are. Many years ago, I have two children, mine are 22 and 20. Many years ago, the first 10 years of my life, I did not know my children. I thought they were screwed up, goofy, all kind of messed up kids. And I finally took the time to understand them. Guess what? They're screwed up, messed up, <laughs> and goofy kids. They're all kind of, but they're unique in their own ways. And I learned to let them have part of their own ways. What we did in our, my family is we compromised. I still have to leave at 6.53 Friday morning. OK? That's me. And so what we sat down and then said, my family says, we'll leave at 6.53, Dad. <laughs> But once we leave, we'll control the time and the destination from this point on. I said, I'll try it one time. I tried it once. I didn't like it. But I tried it the second time. I started to like it. What we do now is I back out of the driveway. And as soon as I back out at 6.53, and they're there 15 minutes before me because they don't want to mess Dad up at the very beginning, OK? <laughs> we drive out the driveway, and we're sitting there. And my kid says, turn left. <laughs> and that's how we go. And we have enjoyed life. And we stop and see the roses, by the way. And it's kind of fun to be unique that way with your family, because they are very special people to you. Uh, the only thing I control besides the time we leave is the money. Now, when we get to bingo money, that's when we turn around and come home. That's the only way we have them. <laughs> uh, speaking of aviators and Air Force people in general, and this belongs to Navy and all the rest of the commands and, and the Marines, etc. Uh, typical Air Force personnel on a PCS move. 
going down an interstate, because interstates are faster, doing 85 in a 55 mile zone, you all go faster than speed limits, and you're driving along, and the wife says, look over there, look at that unique, I've never seen that before, what do you say, guys? Press on, you betcha. <laughs> yeah, got the old schedule to make here. We'll get to it later. How many times have you ever stopped back and seen it later? Never. Never. And then you get to your destination that night and you go into the motel room, what do you say? Ain't much to do. Let's watch TV tonight. <laughs> what are we in such a hurry for? Why have we denied ourselves the privilege of seeing life? But we get into this set ETA routine that it's very hard for us to break. I ask you to take a look at that with your family because it does create problems in your lifestyle. Okay, what I just covered was the good things about you. <laughs> Let me talk about the defects in your personality. You lack spontaneity. You're a sucker for complacency. The role of ritual in itself is a trap. Familiarization breeds contempt. And positive male feedback is what drives you. Let me restate that last one. You love men more than you love women. <laughs> Did you all know that? Did you all know that you love men more than you love women? It's very true in this business. But I'm going to let you think about that, because that's kind of hard on our image. So I'll let you all kind of deal with that a little bit. You lack spontaneity. You all are an extremely intelligent group of people. One of the highest IQs as far as groups are concerned, okay, professional grouping. Enormous amount of intelligence. But you do not free think. Oh, you'll plan on something else that somebody else did, and you'll kind of rework things, but you do not come up with brand new ideas. I've been briefing this for years now, and I've asked people in groups, how many of y'all have come up with a brand new, unique idea in the last year? Something that was a new type of invention, something that changed somebody's life. I'll ask y'all, how many of y'all come up with them? My, my, my. Maybe. What was it, sir? Uh, I finished my uh, PhD dissertation research. Okay. Okay, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. You're the fourth person out uh, of around 16,000 that I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy that. I'm not talking to you anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, well, where does this cause us problems? Well, it caused the aviation career field problems in only about one case in your life. <laughs> Because what you are is stimulus response people. We give you a stimulus, you do a response to it. You're flying along an airplane, the fairlight comes on there. <laughs> and you guys are fantastic about that. But have you ever come up with a brand new, unique emergency in that aircraft, or any other walk, any other phase of your lifestyle, and you have to come up with a brand new idea? What happens is because you do not free associate and free think you will most likely come up with the wrong idea because you are trained to come up with an idea and make a reaction right then and there. And around 90 to 91 percent of the cases initially, if you come up with that reaction, it will be wrong. Brand new, unique idea, okay, for an aircraft emergency. And what we're trying to tell you, and most of you know this, when you've been in emergencies, in almost all cases, you have at least a couple seconds to think about it. You don't have to react like a trained dog. Sit there and take a look at the dang thing. Come up with a couple extra ideas. Ask the man on the ground. Sure, he's the old man, but he's got some ideas too. Talk to the safety man. Talk to your crew, whatever the case may be. But come up with about five to six alternatives on how to handle that emergency. And in that time, about 87% of the cases, you will use the right one, and it will not be the first one that you started out with. Because you do not free associate, you do not free think. You just grab it for straws at that period of time, okay? You're a sucker for complacency because you're good. You're pro, and pro, pros have systems and methods, and systems and methods in the hands of a pro cannot fail. And what you've done is sell, sold yourself a bill of goods and turned around and bought it, lock, stock, and barrel. You think there are times you're infallible in an aircraft or whatever else you do. And whenever you feel that way, make dang sure you do not get on board that aircraft because you're an accident waiting to happen. You make a mistake each and every time you fly or do your particular uh, job, if it's a very complex job. Okay? Each and every time you make at least one error. Familiarity breeds contempt. Airplanes only kill others. How many times have we said that? How many times have we thought that? Why did old Joe die last week? Jeez, he made a stupid mistake. Golly, I wouldn't have done that. Horse crap. You've all done it. Every one of you in here has made a mistake. 
and every one of you's gotten by with it. And every one of us says, I ain't gonna do that one again, okay? We all make mistakes, and we gotta own up to them. <clears throat> when you first got in aircraft, and I'm gonna talk specifically to the aviators here now, but when you first got in aircraft, you were in great awe of that aircraft. We call it awe, but what we mean is you sat down inside that cockpit for the first time, and you looked at all those instruments, you went, oh, <laughs> all that crap. You know, how does anybody do that, you know? And after you've done it a couple of times, you say, hey, ain't that hard. Shucks, they can train a monkey to do that. You look at the syllabus, it says you got a couple of hairy missions coming up, and you did them. And once you finished doing those, you changed your personality. Because now you knew you could do all of the things that the book said that you were supposed to do. And before you used to go out and fly the aircraft, and now you go out and strap the sucker on. You see, you're in control of it now. It has no control over you. And every time you're in a weapon system, every time you're in a weapon system, and you've been in it for six months, this thing creeps its head in there. And it's something that you need to take a look at because every six months you're going to, have to take a look at how you become familiar with that aircraft weapon system and you have to stand off from it and say these are the way that sucker's trying to kill me these are the things that i'm getting complacent in new study that was just out as you get older and older you get even though you lose some of your reflexes you have a whole lot bit more experience than the younger troops but you know where your problem areas lie as far as accidents are concerned procedures procedures you get complacent, you know, what the heck, I know what the instrument procedures are, I know what this is, I know what that is. And you press without really doing a lot of background work on it, because see your old head. Familiarity breeds contempt. Speaking of that, you have in your family. When y'all were first dating your spouses, y'all were very aware of that. I'm sorry, honey, it's a little cold in here, let me turn the heat up for you. Too much wind in your hair, my love, let me roll the wind up for you. Here's a lovely rose. We're going out to a special place to eat tonight. Now you'll go home tonight, or when you go leave here at TDY and go home, you'll sit down on the, on the sofa, put your feet up on the coffee table, drink your beer, turn the TV on, and say, what's to eat tonight, bitch? <laughs> Familiarity breeds contempt. And if you don't do something about that every six months, you'll be married singles within five years. So make sure you understand that. You need to do those special things for that spouse. She doesn't know you care about her day to day. You need to tell her. And you need to tell her as often as possible. Okay? Uh, speaking of that, I was talking to y'all about a little bag you had over your shoulder. Y'all got a little small bag, about a five gallon bag. Your spouse has about 50, 100 gallon bags over her shoulders. And inside her bag, she has all of life's hurts. Every one of them. And if you ever want to find out, find out what pissed your wife off last week, piss her off today. She'll tell you. <laughs> you remember what you did last? No, you forgot it, man. You've already compartmentalized it out. Continue to get her angry. She'll tell you what you did last year, six years ago when you were dating. If you want to continue to piss her off, she'll tell you what her father did to her, her brothers, men in general. And if you want to work on her for three days, really continue to steam her for three days, she will tell you something else, what you're going to do in the future. And what, you know what? She's going to be damned accurate, okay? <laughs> yeah. But why do our wives have all that trash in her trash bag? Guess when you clowns are gone TDY? When's your car break down? When's the refrigerator not work? When's little Johnny break his arm? When's Mary get in trouble at school? When's all that stuff happen? That's when you guys are gone and blow the old lady. She's just stuffing her right in the bag, okay? And she's going to use it at the most inopportune time for you, which is about always, okay? Because you're not willing to hear any of that trash. But we point this out for a specific reason right here. Whenever you hear this, this is a good checklist item for you. It be means that you have become familiar with your spouse. And so if you're hearing this, what it means is you have to go back and become more aware of who she is as a person and deal with her as a human being, okay? That's why she brings it out. She doesn't feel good about herself. She's hurting inside. Ritual, methodology supersedes the goal. I don't know what your rituals are and the jobs that you do, but I want to point out as an example. Many years ago, I used to fly a bird called a T-bird. Some of you older people in here might have done that. Do we have any T-bird pilots in here? Yeah, we got more than all right. <clears throat> Not too many of us around anymore. Uh, where was the ejection handle? Sorry, in the... Uh, down here. Hey, here, down here by the injection seat on the left side. Traffic pattern checklist was this. You get in a traffic pattern, you bring the power back, get the warning horn on, put the gear angle down, 
Check the three indicators down, lock the warning horn out. And the last item on the checklist, reach back down and jiggle check that hummer. Yeah, and jiggle check. And the idiot could see it was down. It threw about that far. It was a long metal handle. And so for a long period of time, that aircraft, I'd drop it down, get it down, lock, check it, look down and tap the top of it. Virtual complete. One day in traffic pattern on downwind, did the same thing. Turn based, power tab five zero, turn based with wheels touching go. Right, Joe, check your wheels down, lock. That didn't have to look, I was good. I've been around a long time. Garage down, lock. Now just the automatic spit it out ritual. As I made my turn and started my descent, bringing the power back, it was funny what God did that day. He gave me about a 40 knot headwind on base. I had to really bring the old power back. As I was bringing my flaps down, the warning horn came on also. Now, you know, it's only an idiot and fool would ever land with the warning horn on. God, it's dumb. <laughs> Gee, can't hear anything. Punch it off. <laughs> <laughs> about halfway through base, tower called some clown in the traffic pattern. How difficult it is to listen to tower when they're on Navy Common. <laughs> Turn it off. You betcha. Turn final. Uh, as I was turning final, it was funny what God did that day. Give me about 40 knotter on base, and when I turned final, gave me about a 60 knotter that day. Just turned it right around 90 degrees. Amazing how I can do those things. Power back past idle, coming down, still about 60 knots or 40 knots on, just barreling into the runway. Nothing making sense to me. About 400 feet from touchdown, two flares shot across my aircraft. I got my attention. <laughs> my first reaction to that was one of total anger. Some jackass is clogging my runway. I can't get a touch and go for crying out loud, and I needed it for currency. I was pissed. I really was. Slammed the throttle in, spooled the engine up about another hour. Uh, <laughs> reached down, and I grabbed the gear, and I broke those two knuckles right there. Position. Okay. And through the pain and agony, I realized that the warning airspeed was for, oh, was for me, the flares were for me. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, and we know this is a fact psychologically. Once you do a ritual and complete it, as far as you're concerned, you can stand on top of the guy with a ball back and beat him over the head and say, you ain't got his gun. They'll say, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So if you have rituals in an aircraft, make dag, I'm sure you understand them, and then try to... They are problem areas. That's why the checklist is there, to follow it completely. Okay? Speaking of rituals, you have them also at home. When you leave the house in the morning, that's a ritual. Bye, dear. I'll see you later. I'll be home tonight. And when you come home at night, same thing. Hi, dear. The hero is home. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time you stuck your tongue in there and rooted around and see what you had for lunch? It's a ritual. <laughs> it's like when you got married, you said, I will love, honor, trust, and obey my wife until death do us part. So we will kiss her goodbye in the morning, kiss when I come home at night. Check, got one of those done. Okay? So take a look at it. Take a look at it. It's something that you need to really be aware of. It's the need for male feedback. You love men more than you love women. And this includes the women that fly in this business. Who gives you your feelings about who you are online? Who makes you feel important about who you are? Who gives you your pats on the back? <coughs> Have you ever all thought about it? It's your peers. It's the guys around you. And if you accept a woman in this business, by the way, in the flying business especially, you accept her as a man, not as a woman. Oh, you talk about the bumps and all that crap, but you accept her because she has the same lifestyle as you, and she does the same way that you do, okay? does things. And so you get most of your positive feelings about the males around you. Now, I'm not going to walk up to him if he's my friend and say, hey, I really love you, you know, you're a neat guy. I'm not going to do that crap. What do we say to each other? Nice mission today. Good job. I really enjoyed myself doing that. Well, the guy have a beer tonight. We're going to have fun doing that, okay? Those are the things that we get our pats on the back about. That's what we live for, for all practical purposes. And that's why we always feel good about ourselves. And that's why we don't know things are crap in a bucket at home. Because we are feeling good about ourselves in this atmosphere that we're at right here. Okay? <clears throat> Where does your spouse get all her positive strokes from? Who 
From you? Bullshit. Excuse me. <laughs> That's where she's supposed to. I agree she should get some from you, okay, but you don't give them. Oh, by the way, I want to cover one other thing I forgot to mention. You get most of your positive strokes from the guys and from flying, for those of you that are flying. Do you all know, for the pilots and the navigators, etc., in here, crew members in here, I should say, you all know why you love to fly? Because you come back? The accomplishment, okay, feedback. Let me explain to you why you love to fly. We talked to aviators for years saying, why do you like to fly? Well, I like to fly because I get feedback. I get, uh, uh, I, I get a thrill of, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, gee, there's some uh, golly, uh, I don't know. And we sat down with this one old guy and we said, why do you like to fly? He said, I love to fly. We said, how long have you been flying? He said, 27 years. How many hours you got? 15,000. What are you going to do when you retire? Fly. <laughs> <laughs> we said, can you tell us why? This is the first guy of many that we talked to. Yep, no problem at all. Well, we got our books out. We want to write that down. We said, tell us why. He said, oh, it was simple. He said, there was, uh, he said it was June 22nd, 1976. I was in Okinawa. Oh, that's amazing. This guy could remember this, you know. He said, we were over there, he said, his crew, he said, we're trying to take off. He said, it was early morning takeoff. Hot, sweaty, mug, muggy, miserable, raining. And every time we tried to get airborne, he said, the airplane would break down. We're going, huh, this is exciting. <laughs> okay. And he said, about five minutes before I had to put my crew in crew rest, we cranked it on the runway, rolled the throttles into it. Boy, we took off. Climbed on out and ran the 35,000 feet level off, brought the throttles back, trimmed them out a little bit, put the aisle powder on, he said, sat back, kind of wiped the sweat off my brow. And so about that time, I looked out, he said, and the kind of the clouds broke over the ocean. And he said, the sun just came up over the horizon. And he said, the waves were very calm. The rays came down over there and said, it's absolutely gorgeous. We're writing this down. We're no boys. It's more of a go ahead. It's women go ahead. That's why I love to fly. And every once in a while, you guys are sitting in that cockpit doing all the trash that Uncle Sam tells you to do. And you look at it and say, hey, this needs shit. Oh, God, I love you. <laughs> Back to work. Okay? And as long as you get that about once a month or once every other month, y'all are totally happy in this business. And we can give you the most crap in the world and y'all will live with it because you want that. That's the positive strokes you want. Now let's go back to the woman, the spouse. Where does she get them from? Where do y'all think your wife gets a lot of her strokes from? Girlfriends. Girlfriends. Guess what your wife talks to the girlfriends about? You. You know what that miserable creep did last night? <laughs> okay. She doesn't get a lot of positive strokes from that, but she does get a lot of venom out. Where else can she get positive strokes from? Family. Kids. Lovely. Wonderful. For those of you that believe that, I'd like you to do me a very special favor this summer. I want you to take 10 days of vacation. I want you to spend 10 days, 24 hours a day, with your children. <laughs> well, let me throw a little caveat in there. Send the wife on the vacation because she's never been alone by herself. She's either been with you, the children, or her, her family. Let her have her own 10 days. You spend the 24 hours a day with your children. Okay? And come back to me and tell me what a great thrill that is to raise your children. To answer the 30,000 why questions, to wipe their snotty little nose, clean their rotten little butts, feed them eight times a day, hassle them to get in the bed, etc., etc., etc. After about two days, you'll be a glittering idiot. You ever notice why you go home at night, the mouth is there at the door? Have you ever figured that out? You open the door at the mouth. I don't know how you You know why? If you've listened to Goo Goo Gagoo shit all day long, you want to talk to somebody intelligent too, okay? That's why she wants to talk to you. Of course, y'all don't want to talk to anybody at that point in time. Well, let's see, she's not getting it from the children, and, she, and she's not getting it from the neighbors or the friends. How about from her job? Does she get it from her job? If she, if she works? Let's say she works. Does she get it from the job? No, not really. Y'all are a very mobile society. You move every 2.7 years. And every time you move, you're moving up the ladder of success. And you're getting more strokes in what you're doing. Let's say she was a teacher or whatever it was. And she had worked up in those 2.7 years and now she moves. Where does she start again? Uh, Boom, right down the bottom again. So she doesn't get a lot there. All right, where should she get a lot? You said it. 
She should get a lot from you. She cannot get all of them from you. If you were the perfect husband, you can still only give her about 50%. She has to find it within herself. But she should be giving po getting positive strokes from you. How do you give positive strokes, guys? <laughs> Let me give you the typical positive strokes from the Air Force, okay? We go home tonight, we sit down at the dinner table, it's 5.30, we don't want to eat at 5.30, whatever time you selected for your family. <laughs> we sit down at that wonderful time and eat, and there's a wonderful piece of meat there, there's some lovely peas, and the mashed potatoes are burnt. Burnt potatoes, bitch. <laughs> hey, you're paying her a heck of a lot of money for this, for crying out loud. Jiminy Christmas. You've got to let her know when she fails at this. You come home tomorrow night, you sit down at the table at 5.30. Again, wonderful meat, lovely vegetables, and look down at the things, and they're perfect tonight. What do you say? Nothing. What the hell are you paying her for, right? <laughs> <laughs> or how about the positive negative? Well, you didn't burn them tonight, bitch. <laughs> so you get one more in, right? <laughs> if your spouse is over 30 years of age, She's thought of suicide one time. She's thought of divorce at least twice. They have a very low self-esteem about themselves because we don't help build that up. And most of our spouses do have problems with that. And it's something we need to take a look at. Very, very high percentage. It was really amazing when we started talking to the gals about <clears throat> So what's a failing aviator? I'm getting to the end of it, guys. Just bear with me. What's a failing aviator? Does anybody know? It's a person that cannot compartmentalize. pick up a DUI or two and he might also pay cash a bad check. Those are kind of the overall things of what happens to this individual. But his actual signs and symptoms are not that there's something else. Now why does he get into this? Does he have a problem at work? Yeah, in some cases, but very, very few. Very few of you will have problems in your job. It will happen at home. And when it happens at home, it does not necessarily mean you're a failing aviator. If you and your wife have been divorced and you're remarried, it doesn't mean you're a failing aviator. If you've had problems in your marriage, it doesn't mean you're a failing aviator. If you've been separated, it doesn't mean you're a failing aviator. I don't mean to imply that. It's when those two things, or that, that fail, uh, failure at home gets so bad that the two of you are batting heads so much, she finally says, the heck with you. She turns around, walks out on the front porch, and gets the biggest megaphone she can get. And she says, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye the world. Let me tell you about the sucker I'm married to. And she gathers everybody in that's from the unit, the base, St. Louis, it don't make any difference, she brings them all there. And she tells them exactly who you are as far as she sees. You never was any good in bed. That's the first thing she will attack is your sexuality. Lousy husband and lousy father. And for the first time you start to hurt 24 hours a day. And you'll manifest it in many different ways. What are the ways that you do it on a day-to-day -day basis? Number one, if you smoke, you'll smoke more. Number two, if you don't smoke, you might pick up the habit. And in some situations, we've seen guys leave their jobs for a uh, piece, uh, not, excuse me, for a leave situation and go out and smoke those little funny cigarettes among society, away from the job. Trying to say to society, see, I'm all right, I'm not what she said. And we've seen that happen quite a bit. Number two, if you drink, you'll drink more. If you don't drink, you might pick up the habit. Why would you drink at a time like this? Twofold. Number one, it's an anesthetist that gets rid of the pain for a short period of time. And number two, it gives you reasons for your actions. I'm sorry, dear, I didn't mean to slap your ear last night. I was drunk. It's not my fault. It's the booze's fault. Number three, he buys a failing aviator automobile. Big, flashy sports car. Now, I haven't looked out here in the parking lot. And some of you might have some. That does not make you a failing aviator. If that's what you wanted all your life, fine. Well, we're talking about the milk toast and the squatter that's been driving around the 75 Chevette three-speed on the column. He goes out and he buys himself a yellow $44,000 Porsche, and he drives the piss out of him. He's trying to tell somebody something. Pick up macho pastime, scuba diving, skydiving, motorcycle racing. Again, if that's your lifestyle, fine. But it's the guy that hasn't done that, all of a sudden at age 42, jumps out of the back end of the airplane and goes, Geronimo, okay? That's the guy we're talking about. Um, since the problem started in the bedroom, as far as the spouse is, then the problem can be solved in the bedroom, as far as you're concerned. Not your own, someone else's. And for the first time in his life, he'll go ugly early. He'll pick someone well below his status, <laughs> and he'll just pray to her, oh, look at this, boy, I can still do it, I'm all right. I ain't what she said. I can still hack the program, okay? 
And the bottom line is he starts to fly dangerously. He starts to take chances to show his buddy and himself that he can still hack the program. That he's not like she said that he was. Why did I brief you on this? Why did I come here? Why do these guys want me here? Let me see a show of hands of all you that are failing aviators. <laughs> Gee, I, I wasted my time again. I don't understand that. Golly. We didn't think most of you or any of you were. The reason why I brief you is this one unique phenomenon about it. Who is the only person in the world that can tell a failing aviator that he's failing? Not himself. Absolutely not. How about the wing commander? No. Squadron commander? Spouse? Spouse? No, he's fighting her. His peers, the people that he loves. And that's why we're briefing you on this, because if you see this kind of activity in your own unit, own group, there is only another person that's the same person as this. In other words, his close friend and peer that can help him out of it. Period. Psychiatrists, psychologists can't do it, because he will not listen to him, he or she. So we're telling you this because it's up to you, because that's where the responsibility lies. That's the only place you can solve it. Now, granted, if you go up to this guy and say, hey, you got a problem here, you're drinking too much, let's talk. He's going to fight you initially, but stay with him because you are his buddy. And if you can get one or two other persons around him that he also <coughs> likes and sit him down within a very short period of time, he will take a look at the problem. And most likely, in every case that we have seen so far that we've identified, he will ground himself because he knows that he's trying to kill himself finally. And in most cases, in fact, everyone we know of except for one, they went back on flying status. One guy did not because of fear of flying. But everyone was back on flying status in a short period of time. There was no stigma against his career. But the most important thing is that you can walk out of that unit at the end of your 20 or 30 years and you say, hey, I wonder what happened to old Joe. He didn't kill himself. He's still alive today. Okay? And that's why we're telling you. Thank you. I appreciate being here.